At 628, so we have two more minutes. Correct. Do we have a majority of the committee members here so that we could get going? Yes, is it exactly 6.30? I think it might be close. Let me see. Yes, it's 6.30. So yes, maybe you could um, do your introductory remarks, Will, about how sure. to speak, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, for anybody, if it's your first time at a Community Board 8 uh, virtual meeting, um, you'll notice that you are muted and you're unable to mute, unmute yourself. Uh, so the way that we'll take questions from the, com from the public and from other folks uh, is through the use of the raise hand feature. Um, so you'll open up the, oh, actually let me stop sharing my screen so it's a little easier for everyone to find it. Everybody get your bearings for a second uh, while you can um, see at the bottom of your screen, there's a participants button that uh, if you click on it, it'll open up uh, a box on your screen that has everybody's names on it. And at the bottom of that box is a raise hand button. So you'll click the raise hand button whenever we're ready for questions and comments and your, hand, your name will pop up to the top of our list and we'll call on you then. Uh, if you're calling in from the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand. And uh, if you have any problems with the, the Zoom platform, you can always chat us through the chat box, but that's not gonna be for taking questions or for comments for the, the applicant. Uh, so uh, with no further ado, uh, Jane and David, if you guys are ready. I've lost uh, <clears throat> the view of, of everybody. So I may have to come back in again. Okay. Uh, well, I'll start the meeting. Um, we only have one agenda item. This is the December meeting of the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 8. We have one application to hear. We, will, we are here to discuss the context and appropriateness of the application within the historic district. And also in this case, um, the Metropolitan Museum sits, this sits in city land which is a landmark, Central Park, the whole park is a landmark. Um, so we will hear from the applicant, we'll hear from the public, if anyone is present, then we will go into executive session to formulate a resolution, which will be presented to our full board on this coming Wednesday night. So I'm, I see a lot of people from the Met are here, so please begin your presentation. So I'm not sure who's gonna, um, I think I'll start. Hi. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, my, my name is Brett Guyard, and I'm the head of capital and infrastructure planning at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's very nice to be with all of you tonight virtually. It's my first virtual community board meeting. Usually, uh, I like being able to see you all in person. Um, so, uh, you know, please feel free to ask questions once we're done our presentation. Uh, we're all happy to answer them. There's many of us from the Met. I don't wanna spend our time going through introducing all of us, but we're all here to answer questions. And we're here tonight to talk about the planned renovation of the Michael Rockefeller wing, which was built 40 years ago to house our arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Ameriscus collection. And I know that it's a strange time 
for all of us right now to be talking about a major capital project in the future. Um, but even during this current crisis, we've been continuing to do our work to, to plan for the museum's future and to work on projects that, that we've started a long time ago. So we've actually been working on this for four years and we are ready, getting ready to implement our enabling work so that we can start moving art out of the space and um, with major construction beginning in about a year. Michael Whetstone is here from Bayer Blinder Bell and I'll hand it over to him in a moment and he'll be able to go through the schedule with you in more detail too at the end. But the goal for our project is to address both the curatorial, um, our, our curatorial goals and our care of the collection. And so we're, we're reimagining the collection in three distinct regions, the arts of Africa, the arts of Oceania, and the arts of the Americas. It was, this collection was gifted to the museum as primitive art. And uh, for the past 40 years, we've been trying to um, address that, that failing in how the collection has been presented to the public. And this is a very, very important project to the museum to be able to do that. But in addition to the reinstallation of the collection, we also need to address um, our failing infrastructure that houses the collection. We want to care for these objects in the same way that we do uh, Greek and Roman art or modern art and with the same level of conservation care and, um, and state-of-the-art tools that we have. And so a big part of this project is the replacement of the sloped glass on the south facade of the building. And that's really why we're here to speak to you all today, because as you know, uh, Landmarks has jurisdiction over this replacement. Uh, we've presented to them and um, they agree with our approach. And now we're coming to you and then eventually to a public hearing to review it with all of them. It, it, the, our goals for replacing the glass are, are critical to address condensation, water infiltration, daylighting control, also bird safety. There, uh, I don't know if there's any bird lovers out there, but <laughs> we have a lot of bird deaths at this location of birds flying into the glass. Um, there is, we, uh, it, it's reflective and we want, would like to address that given our location in the park and our care for birds. Uh, you all, are also probably aware as our neighbors that we have a sister wing to this, which is the Sackler wing. Um, and that will, Mike will address that when he talks about the project, but uh, the two wings, while they may look similar from the outside have very different purposes on the inside. The Temple of Dender spent most of its life outside and is very much meant to feel as though it's outside and in the park. Whereas the m many of the objects that we have in the Oceania collection, the Africa collection, and the Americas collection are actually light sensitive. And so the fact that they're right next to a south facing glass wall has been problematic throughout the wings history. And that's something that's very important for us to address in this project. And with that, I'll hand it off to Mike Whetstone from Bayer Blinder Bell. He is a principal there. Mike. Uh, thank you everybody. Thank you, Brett. Uh, nice to see everybody. I'm Michael Whetstone, principal of Bayer Blinder Bell. And uh, I think I would like to share my screen. If I will try to do that so I can show the presentation. Okay, so first question is, can everybody see uh, the presentation on the screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, and I will go right into it. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, the museum is located in um, Central Park, as you know, which means by the way that the, the Landmarks Commission requires us to go to all the community boards that surround the park. So uh, this is of course the first, but that we're going to go through six community boards over the next uh, five or six weeks before we come to the public hearing. And just to give everybody the context, here's an aerial view of the Met with Fifth Avenue at the bottom and uh, Central Park uh, on, on the top. And the Rockefeller Wing is this modern piece on the south. And just a little bit of the historical context. This plan of the Met is uh, from 1970. It's the uh, Kevin Roche and John Dinkaloo master plan that was adopted. And uh, what you see in pink is the extent of the museum in 1970. Uh, and the extent of the museum actually when it was landmarked in 1967. So at that time, of course, the, the full Fifth Avenue facade by Richard Morris Hunt and McKimmed and White was constructed. But the, the parts of the museum at the rear facing the park were not yet completed. The museum had always intended to grow to approximately this footprint. So the Landmarks Commission approved all of the wings in yellow on the master plan of 1970. And over the course of 20 years, uh, from the 1970s into the early 90s, all those wings were constructed. The Temple of Dender and the American Wing and the Lehman Wing were first in the 70s, followed by these wings on the south side 
uh, in the 80s and 90s. And uh, so the Rockefeller Wing is before the Landmarks Commission because it is a modern addition that was approved by the Landmarks Commission 40 years ago, and we are proposing changes uh, to that design that was approved by the commission. And again, the, the part of the scope that's really uh, subject to Landmarks Review is this red area. It's this large sloped curtain wall, which is more easily seen in this aerial view. So here you can see outlined in red is that piece of glass, 200 feet long and uh, 60 feet tall and facing south. Now the scope of the project, as Brett mentioned, is the AAOA Galleries, which is the Met's acronym for Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. And that 40,000 square foot suite of galleries is being redone. That's the major part of the project. And as you can see in the section, the uh, orange line is the sloped glass piece that we are replacing. So that's the, the part of it that, that uh, is subject to landmarks review. There's a south elevation of the building. You can see the large glass facade between the McKimmead and White Limestone uh, Wing K on the, on the right, and uh, the Roche Dinkaloo 1987 Modern Wing uh, on the left. And just looking at the uh, original proposal, this is uh, the 1970 model by Roche Dinkaloo of that, of that plan. You can see, as Brett mentioned, of course, that this slo large sloping glass wall faces south, uh, which is a, a heavy burden for a glass building, which is trying to protect fragile art objects. And of course, Roche Dinkaloo understood that. And you can see in their original proposal with this glass facade that they thought that perhaps the upper part of the facade would be more opaque and more reflective. And the lower part of the facade would be uh, more, more transparent for views. And the construction drawings from 1975 show just that. There's two kinds of glass. The bottom two rows were more clear and the upper rows were more opaque. And that was the intent, but the glass technology was not so sophisticated as it is now in the 1970s. And the amount of light and the amount of uh, solar gain coming through that glass wall has been problematic ever since. And these are some of the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, here's a photograph of the inside. On the left is uh, the wing when it first opened up in the 1980s. And you can see immediately from the very beginning, there were mesh roller shades going from top to bottom, the full 60 foot, feet height of the glass because there was so much light coming in. Those uh, galleries were modified uh, in, in the mid 2000s to extend the, the second floor paintings galleries. And so the original interior space where the glass has been changed, but you can still see right now, uh, what, what happens is that the, the, these um, shades really block the view and uh, just attempt to cut down the light. But uh, it was discovered uh, about 15 years ago that even with the shades, the amount of light coming in was too much uh, for the art objects. So around 2005, they, they put a plastic film or screen on the outside of the glass, uh, which has deteriorated. And um, this is one of the problems the Mets would like to address. In addition to the fact that the curtain wall is beginning to deteriorate from corrosion and from chronic uh, condensation problems. So for this reason, uh, as these galleries are renovated, uh, the, the Met decided to propose to replace this entire curtain wall with a much higher performing uh, technological uh, glass piece because better technology is available now than was 40 years ago. And here's a, a view of that entire facade, the floor plan relationship to the galleries. And this, this just quickly, these are some of the goals that are, are, are proposed for the, for the glazing system. Uh, one of them is the real, greater resistance to condensation. Um, because the museum keeps a high level of humidity to conserve the art objects, 70 degrees, Fahrenheit and 50 degrees relative humidity. During the winter, when the curtain wall becomes cold, there's a tendency for water and condensation to form on the inside of the curtain wall and for it to drip down, uh, which is very uh, problematic. And uh, the, the thermal breaks and, uh, and technology for curtain walls at the time were not able to handle that amount of humidity. So we would like to address that. Uh, we also want to, of course, control the amount of light coming in. What we would ideally like to do is control the light coming in for art conservation so you still get natural light, but we don't need to have those shades. And there are uh, treatments of glass which will allow us to do that. Uh, we'd like to be able to control the quantity of light, uh, make it much more thermally efficient for energy savings. And as Brett mentioned, we would like to address the bird safety problem because birds, when they see angled glass reflecting the sky, they think that it is the sky and they, they meet their untimely end by colliding with the glass. And then of course, there are other areas, gutters, flashing mechanical systems. We're trying to address all of that comprehensively. 
So this is just uh, what we're proposing to remove. It's really just the, only the glass curtain wall. You can see in section and then elevation in red, those are the removals. And then we get into the proposed design. So in order to address all of these uh, uh, increases in performance for the glass, uh, we are proposing a couple of changes to the design of the glass. The glass will look a little bit different and the system will look a little bit different and that's why we are, are going through a public hearing process. So I will show you what those are. First, you can see that the top is the existing elevation. The, the glass panels are, are quite small, uh, two feet, six inches wide, five feet tall. And we are proposing for reasons that I'm about to show you uh, a larger grid so we have a larger uh, a panel of glass, seven feet, six inches tall, and three foot, seven inches wide. So the, the grid is proposed to change. We think that uh, when you compare existing and new, when you think of this building as a single sheet of glass, a single volume of glass sandwiched between these two limestone clad wings, the uh, architect's original intent of a glass clad volume uh, and a sheer, sheer glass surface is still going to be there. Uh, the differences we think are, are, are subtle with the change in the grid. Um, so as I showed you in that original model and intent by Roche Dinkaloo, they understood the idea that we have to block some of the sun. And so like they did, we're proposing to have different glass at the top than the bottom. Uh, but what we're proposing is that each row of glass will be different uh, as you go up, up, up to the top. So the glass at the bottom would be where you could really see out and without shades for the first time you will be able to see out. Uh, and then as you go up the rows of glass, uh, towards the ceiling up to the height of 60 feet, the glass uh, little by little becomes more and more opaque and more translucent and less than light comes in to the top. When you get to the top in this kind of triangle of dead space up here, very little light is coming in, but that's not illuminating anything. So, so that's okay. So that is the basic concept for the glass. Seen from the inside, you can see that idea of being able to see out the bottom row and then glowing glass with uh, decreasing amounts of translucency as you go up to the top and we're able to achieve that uh, translucency with films that are laminated between the glass rather than applied to the outside. So it won't, be, won't, won't deteriorate uh, in the sunlight like the, uh, the, the current film has. And then here's a view of the inside showing uh, both the change in the glass transparency and the change in the grid. And you can see that the, the curators wanted to have a more open feeling with, with larger pieces of glass. And by raising the height of the first piece of glass, one is able to get a good view out uh, if you're a person standing on the floor. Uh, even though we wanted to get rid of all the shades, there's so much light coming in and the art is fragile that we will have to have shades some of the time. So during the warm summer months when the sunlight is at its greatest, there will still be a shade that retracts from the floor and only covers the first row of glass, the first two rows of glass when the museum is closed, the only the first one when it's open, but that will only be for a few months a year and not the, the typical condition. And uh, since the different pieces of art have different sensitivities to light, it might even be that the Oceana has the shades up in America it doesn't. Uh, but this is still, we think, uh, an improvement because much of the time you'll be able to see out and there will not be the full height shades going from, from top to bottom. So this is just a, a rendering of the new uh, galleries, which are uh, in design as well at the same time as this curtain wall project. Uh, you can see on the left the shades and what we hope will be a much more open feeling with uh, the glass simply glowing rather than being covered by these shades. And of course the glass and properties of the glass and light transmittance that you see in the curtain wall are, are very precisely um, uh, uh, calibrated uh, for the conservation goals of all the uh, objects that will be displayed in the galleries. So now I'm gonna talk about the glazing system. And here's where there actually is gonna be probably the key visual difference between the existing sloped glazing and the new sloped glazing. So at the top three drawings, you can see what is there now. And it is a traditional curtain wall system or a sloped glazing system where there is a mullion cap on the outside. You see this aluminum grid cap on the outside of the mullion. Uh, and what we're proposing is a system that is newer technology, but is much, much, much more efficient, which is to have uh, no cap on the outside simply to have a flush glass joint and to attach the glass from the inside. And the reason this makes a huge difference for the Met with its high humidity levels, as you can see in the cross sections, when you have that aluminum cap on the outside, there are inevitably little screws or clips going through the glass between the joints, holding on to the cap on the outside. And those are cold bridges and they tend over the 12,000 square foot area of this glass, they tend to make lots of little cold spots and, and, and compromise the thermal bridge so that the inside gets cold 
water forms on the inside and water begins to drip off onto the floor and onto the artwork. But if we can hold onto the glass and attach everything from the warm side of the glass and really leave the outside, the cold surface uh, facing the exterior to be uh, uh, untouched by anything from the inside, it's a huge increase in efficiency. So this is something that is really a, a big aesthetic change, but it's an aesthetic change driven entirely by the need uh, and desire to have better, more efficient technology. It's, it's not driven uh, from a design point of view uh, visually. Um, but this, although it's perhaps the kind of system is not, not so critical in a residential or a commercial structure, in a museum structure, which is a very special environment that keeps these high levels of humidities, uh, the difference in, 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 in um, efficiency uh, is, is enormous. So we are proposing to take this uh, forward technologically. A little bit more about the glass. Uh, it's a double laminated glass. Uh, the film on the inside lamination is what controls the amount of light levels. And on the outside are frits. And you can see there's little white dots. And that is actually what prevents birds from flying into the glass. Uh, the birds perceive the little dots and this has been tested and there are now standards uh, for, for bird safety. They perceive the little white dots as a solid surface and so they won't fly right into it. And uh, the, the dots are visible close up, but just like uh, the dots in a photograph in a newspaper, once you back off a few feet, uh, you really can't see them at all. Here's a couple of uh, samples of the actual glass that we're proposing. On the left is the glass at the bottom row and one of the glass, pieces of glass in the upper row at the right. Interestingly enough, and we just found this out last week, but this bird safety glass idea that the New York City Building Code is going to adopt it. So these bird dot fritz are actually going to be required in the building code for projects that are filed as of next year, 2021. So these um, have gone from being a voluntary design feature uh, in the park to being actually uh, required by, by both the building code. And just uh, some details, we're of course gonna replicate the profiles at the top of the gutter and the bottom and the sides where it connects to the rest of the building, but with better uh, insulation and condensation control. And just to show a rendering after all, all that uh, technical information, this is what uh, the, the, the glass looks like right now. Uh, you can see the aluminum mullion caps on the outside of the glass. And then here's a rendering of what it will look like with this new technology. It'll be, it'll be smoother, uh, uh, but it'll still be the same large volume of glass. You can perceive a little bit the changes of the glass as you go up the surface, uh, transparent to more uh, opaque. However, because this glass is tilted back 20 degrees, it's always reflecting the sky. And it's an effect that you can see if you go outside and look at car windshields in the street. Car windshields always reflecting some of the sky, they're hard to see through. So no matter the quality of the glass, whether transparent or opaque, it's still going to be somewhat reflective. And I think therefore more about kind of a unified, unified look. Just a couple of other close up renderings of the before uh, with the old system and, and the new. But there's one important thing about this, this site, which is that this is not actually a, a part of the Met that you can walk right up to and get close to. These are, those are photographs that I took. But uh, for the average person walking in the park, you're usually quite far away from that glass. In these photos, you can see the pedestrian path on the south side of the Met is on the far left and the top photograph and the far right and the lower photograph. You're kind of 50 to 75 feet away from the glass. You're down the hill. There's a screen of trees in front of it. So Inevitably, this glass is really seen not up close like a street facade, but as a kind of a background. It's a background and it's a background seen through a screen of trees. So I think that that means that the, the differences will be um, probably not noticed by, by the majority of people. Similarly, uh, viewed from Fifth Avenue and the McKimmon and White facade, uh, you can see that the, the glass the wall, which is sloped 150 feet back from the street, you'll see it at a very oblique angle. And, might not be, the change might not be that perceptible. We were asked by the Landmarks Commission, they were saying, well, if you're gonna change one of these uh, glass wings, I mean, can you see it at the same time as other parts in the Met where the glass touches the ground? Which is a fair question. And this is a axonometric of the Southeast corner of the Met. So you can see that these wings are so big, the modern and contemporary wing, which has massive limestone walls, uh, actually makes you have to walk about 450 feet to go from the Peachtree Court facade to the Rockefeller facade. So we think that this, this glass facade exists somewhat in isolation. You would never see it at the same time as some of these other wings. And so we think that the difference, which is subtle, will be, uh, will, will be acceptable. 
And you might have been thinking this to yourself, just as the Landmarks Commission did. did they said, well, what about uh, the symmetrical twin on the north side where the Temple of Dender is housed? And uh, as Brett mentioned, um, uh, this is a symmetrical wing. There is no uh, intent or, or there's no funding and there's no application to do anything to the Temple of Dendra wing at this time. Uh, but the, 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 the LPC, they asked us to include this just for reference. And so we are, are doing just that. And that is to say that uh, the, the Temple of Dendra wing, which was built just a few years earlier, is architecturally pretty much exactly symmetrical. The difference is of course that it faces north and because it faces north, it doesn't have all the sun problems. However, the condition of the curtain wall is actually very similar. Eventually it will need to be replaced. Um, and we would even propose to replace it uh, with a similar system at one point. And here's a rendering of the Temple of Dendra wing at the bottom, Rockefeller at the top. But this is only for reference. It shows a future intent and it is absolutely not part of this application. Uh, yes, Landmarks to confirm that that was the case and they, they did say that it was. Similarly, uh, uh, one can ask the same question as Landmarks did about the, the glass roofs of these two wings, which are actually not visible from the park as they're set back and fairly flat. And the idea is to do the same kind of replacement, the same kind of system eventually, but it's not part of the current plan, uh, but it will be uh, uh, at some point in the future, but not part of this application included here uh, at Landmarks request just for, for reference for to show a future, a future intent. And that would be the same kind of a system. And just one more thing before I come to the end of this, which is a precedent for this kind of system used at the Met. And that is the skylights over the European paintings galleries, what we call wings A, B, and C. They're the oldest wings at the Met uh, at the back uh, facing the park, although somewhat landlocked now and uh, under construction right now. And in fact, the, the first phase of that project was just completed and opened to the public over the past weekend. Is there a complete replacement of 30,000 square feet of skylights over the paintings galleries, some of which are uh, visible to the park. And so Landmarks actually approved this on a staff level in 2017 because these skylights are kind of high up and not particularly visible, not as visible as the Rockefeller wing. But in this case, with this 350 foot long uh, slope of glass facing the park, we did actually put in the same system. It went from a 1930s old system. You can see it illuminates the attics over the paintings galleries here uh, to uh, the system that we are proposing, corrugated gla wire glass to uh, this new uh, um, um, sleek uh, silicone support, support glazed glass. Uh, so this was approved by them. Same kind of system. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that we showed them and they referenced it when we showed them this project is just uh, an interesting concept for approaching skylights at the Met. Um, the skylights at the Met, of course, have been replaced several times. Every two, two or three generations, they need to be replaced. McKimmead and White, when they came to uh, the Met in 1907, the, the first thing they did was actually to replace all the skylights. Uh, this is what that wing looked like uh, at, uh, 120 years ago. But they have a note on the drawing that we noted and one of their skylight details. And the note says, this section of the skylight is intended to be a standard of quality. Contractors shall use this type or another equally good to be approved by the architects. And we took this to mean that McKimmead and White at that time understood that, that the, the skylight was a, a technology and a kind of a piece of infrastructure. And that really what the Met should do is put the best possible kind on it. And uh, the, the skylight technology has evolved over the years. And um, over the course of these European paintings wings that's gone from McKimmead and White's flat wire glass to this 1930s corrugated uh, wire glass, which overlaps like shingles, which was incredibly long lived, but was terrible for condensation and, uh, and thermal and to the one that we put, are putting in now. So there was this idea that we proposed to the Met that really it makes sense for skylights at the Met, which are so critical to conserve the collection to evolve as the technology allows and Met should always have the best. And it's really more of a art conservation and mission kind of appropriateness than perhaps uh, looking at the, 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 the trueness to the original look of the glass. There's just a rendering of that subtle change facing the park, which is under construction now. And those skylights, uh, same kind that we're proposing for uh, the Rockefeller wing under construction. And here they are on the west side of the museum facing the park under construction. And this, this photograph was just taken a couple of weeks ago. So that concludes uh, the presentation. I'll just say which is one thing about the schedule. Uh, uh, if all goes uh, as planned, this construction uh, would begin uh, next fall, next November and take about 14 months. And uh, hopefully we'll be uh, at that point soon.
So thank you for listening to all that and we welcome your questions and comments. Well, thank you very much. It was a very, very impressive presentation. I think all the members of the committee would agree with that. Um, Will, I think we can stop the screen share. Um, yeah, if Michael. Yep, uh, I will certainly do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the application? And it's just a friendly reminder to go to the participants menu at the bottom of your screen, pop open that box and use the raise hand button or hit star nine if you're calling in from the phone. Any raised hands, Will? Only Michelle Birnbaum, but we'll go through oh, the but list. That, we'll go to the committee. Um, if there are no other, no one from the public, we can go to the committee. And why don't we hear in alphabetical order? I think that's easier, Will. Okay. Um, Thank you. So Michelle, I'm gonna lower your hand because you'll be back up in a second. Um, so we'll start with Elizabeth Ashby at the top of the order. Yeah, well, I, I would really like to hear from the architects on our committee uh, because I think this is one of the disadvantages of a Zoom meeting. We don't get to see uh, material samples. Uh, one thing, uh, nothing to do with architectural appropriateness, but I'm delighted that you're using glass, that uh, bird-safe glass. Uh, I have no affection for glass buildings, uh, and uh, that they kill birds is just another thing I don't like about them, but... Um, I don't think that this is a dramatic enough change um, to oppose from, and I'm very grateful for your presentation, but uh, I will uh, reconsider when I hear all the brilliant things that my co-committee members have to say. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next would be Gail Barron. So give me one second to get her unmuted. Go ahead, Gail. You said that the glass will be smoother uh, than it currently is. Will it be the same thickness? Uh, uh, thank you. The, uh, the, the glass will be smoother only in that it will not have those aluminum mullion caps forming a grid. That's what I meant by smoothness. And the glass actually will be quite a bit thicker because there are many more layers. So it, it offers many more layers of protection. And uh, the smoothness comment was really about the, the removal of those aluminum grid caps. And is the insulation similar to what is currently being uh, constructed on the skylights or is it different? Uh, it's actually a triple glazed glass and uh, it is uh, probably you know, the, really the highest kind of uh, insulation value you can get out of this kind of glass. So it's a very, very high performance system that's being proposed. And also, what about the wind loads? We've had such bizarre weather. You know, we're suddenly at 70 degrees of this, and then the wind is kind of uh, swooping around at uh, 100 miles an hour. Right. Well, this, it, is being, uh, it is being very robustly uh, engineered for, for that kind of thing. OK. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Gail. So next is Michelle Birnbaum. Hi, thank you. Terrific presentation. <clears throat> Easy to understand. Um, it looks like good improvements. And from what I can see, unless I hear something <clears throat> really to the contrary, I, I think I can fully support it. Let me just clarify your first two levels from the ground and the one above it. Do those have fritz too, or do those not have fritz? Uh, they do have fritz. And what's interesting about the fritz is they are really only visible close up. And particularly from the inside, they really kind of dissolve into kind of what you call a slight haze or a slight glow. And I, and I use the analogy of dots that are making up a photograph in a newspaper. Once you're you know, a foot away, you, yeah, you don't really like see them anymore. dots. But they, so, so, but they are the same dimension as the dots i'll use that word going up yes yes the uh, they're the, clearer. you said the first two floors were transparent right so so, so there's two layers of uh, of of uh, screens in the glass so the dots stay consistent the entire way up and then the uh the film 
actually uh, on the inside is what becomes more and more opaque as you go up. So there's there's two oh, levels so of solar control. It's not the fritz. It's just it's the it's the layering. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. And I assume it's also since it's sloped. I don't know if the sloping is different than than the original or not the original, but what you're replacing, so that it yes. tolerates the weight of the snow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The the slope is a, is exactly the same. Is exactly the same. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Next is our chair, Alita Camp. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Jane. I think it's fine. Um, I I'm, agree with Elizabeth on the birds and the proximity to other glass walls is not a problem because the Met clearly was designed and put together in different periods of time with different materials and different perspectives. So I don't have any trouble with any of that. I think it looks like it will be really terrific. Thank you. And an excellent presentation. Thank you, Alita. Next is Sarah Chu. Uh, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Then next would be Anthony Cohn. Okay, it, wonderful presentation. Absolutely, it's fine. It is so much an improvement over the existing. There is nothing worse than peeling film. <laughs> um, but I do have one question. Um, which is sort of more the architectural historical question. Why did, or do you know why um, Roche Dinkaloo chose the glass, the module that they did both uh, across and up and down? Um, and is it because it's what they always used everywhere or, or, or do we just not know? Yeah, it's a it's a good question because it is kind of an unusually small grid, and they and they and yeah. that is something that they were using at that time. You know, uh, Kevin Rocha died a couple of years ago, and his office closed. But when we began working on the Met about eight years ago, we actually went to his office and interviewed him, and I it was sort of a privilege to hear him talk about his design intent for the back of the Met, and what he said was he thought that. Uh, you know, the front of the Met was so impressive, but facing the park, he did not want to have a very imposing building. So his idea was that it would be alternating glass, which would be reflective and you would only see trees and blocks of limestone, which he envisioned being covered with ivy and it would blend in. So he was really trying to make uh, these big tall wings at the back of the Met kind of blend in and, and go away. So I, I can only tell you that that was what I heard was his design intent historically. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. Next would be May Malik. May, are you there? Oh, you muted yourself. Try that one more time. Thank you so much. Sorry about that, Will. Um, I, I don't have any immediate questions or comments. I wanna thank um, the applicant for a really great and thorough presentation. I don't have any immediate flags, thank you. Thank you, May. Then Harrison. Hi, uh, yes. Good evening. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, so the one question I have, I don't know, this might have been mentioned during the presentation. If it was, I apologize. I, I seem to fly over my head. But um, uh, so the glass that is going to have, you know, a special design as to ensure that pigeons and other birds don't fly into it. Uh, will that difference in design be visible to those inside the building too? Will it change the aesthetic of the glass walls at all for those walking within the galleries? You know, from the inside, it's actually not that visible because it's the, the, the white dots or the gray dots tend to blend in with the sky and the brighter outside. So it's something that you can see close up, but once you back off more than a few feet, you just kind of get a slight haze or frosted glass effect. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Marco Tamayo. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I see your presentation? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested to see the details of the new uh, connections of the, the new panels. Can I see that, please? Because I want to ask a, a very specific question. Oh, sure, absolutely. Let me just go back and... All right, let me see if I can go back. So, so which part... Uh... Well, you connect the two new, the, the, the glasses. Let's see. 
uh, mullions. You mean That's, this slide? Uh, no. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. What is this in the bottom where you have a round circle and then what it is in the top? It is coking, what it is. And uh, right in here? It's a circle. Oh, what yes. So, 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 so in the... Um... You can see in the drawing here, uh, when you look at the outside of the glass, you have the pieces of glass and then there's really a, just a piece of, of, uh, of, of sealant, silicone sealant between them, right? Thin piece of sealant. Silicone sealant. Yeah, and behind it is a piece of foam which holds it in place. So that's just really oh, part oh, of the, uh, oh, okay. the, the sealant assembly. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I understand. Okay. okay. You, I think that's the question. Okay, okay. now mm -hmm. let, me, let me start saying the following. First of all, you inherited a nightmare because uh, the design, it shouldn't be an abuse of glass. It's not your problem, you didn't create that. And because there is less conscience of, of using and abusing of glass, now you see that the proposal of the, lamin the la lamination, the exterior lamination is in very bad shape and that's for one of your problems. The second problem is Again, the abuse of glass produce condensation. And the third part is you have too much light that now you have to figure it out. How. So clearly it is said, you shouldn't have too much glass. But that is again, you try to figure it out something that is landmark, something to, for looking for a solution. So now your solution, yes, you try to run away for the thermal bridge. Absolutely right. But the thermal bridge you can resolve for different ways. You can break the thermal bridge and you still can have that kind of situation because your proposal, I think you have the same consequence of the laminate glass. Because remember, one of the biggest problems of when you face windows is the ultraviolet rays, the UV, that is the most damages for no for any 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 other element from outside mm -hmm. especially if you if you have large exposure like in this case so using it like a, my trainer used to say uh P pookie i don't know what it is pookie but he's very ironic to mention this this the silicon or coatings or whatever it is this all these elements with the time the problem is you have two elements that have different modules of the elasticity. And this element works independently. And the, the, usually it fails that the, 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 the material that is weak. And usually the weak is exactly the silicon because it's too much expansion and contraction, the fatigue is right away. So you may have a, have a problem in, in your future using this kind of materials. Even though they looks clean, it looks fine, but this solution probably was just on a whole probably maybe 10, I don't know, maybe 20 years. And that's it, you still go back to the point zero. It's true that you try to improve with double or triple glass, which basically is not much difference. It is still the same problem. So the solution, per personally myself, I find that the, the only thing you try to do is to replace in kind when you have an opportunity to make a different statements and you have an opportunity to actually protect the, the, the extraordinary values that they have inside of this museum. So if I had to approve, yes, um, I think your solution, I don't think your solution, but this is a technical solution. This is nothing that we judge uh, in, our, in our committee. In our community, we're going for the uh, it is relevant according with what we discussed. But at the end of the day, we have to see how, how it's gonna be, how long it's gonna hold that, 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 that solution. And usually in Landmark, uh, those buildings, and that is Elizabeth uh, Ashby, she's right. Always the traditional materials work better. And, and you can see hundreds of years and it's still in good condition, the front facade. Uh, Marco, we're just dealing with the application in front of us. I'm doing, I'm doing because this is relevant on that part. But in order to make my comments, I had to raise the technical issue to demonstrate one part of, not only for this application, by the way, all the applications are the same when we deal with windows. And this is a large, a huge window, 200 feet wide. 
So this is why I'm going in that direction. And that is relevant with all the applications when you mix two different materials. Uh, Elizabeth, she's right. She's saying use the same traditional materials, the history materials. That is what it is. And that is basically we have, the, you are in this problem that maybe the solution looks clean, but in the future it's not going to hold much. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Um, so now we'll move to our public members, Christina Davis, and then we'll move to Kimberly Selway after that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't have any more questions, and I, I just would like to commend Byron Blinderville. For, I mean, this, to me, it's another example of their excellent work on historic landmarks, which they have all over the city. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And finally, Kim Selway, and then we'll go back to our co-chairs. Thank you, Will, and thank you, Jane. Um, again, just to echo what everyone else has said thus far, great presentation. Um, and I agree with some of the comments from Elizabeth and Elite in particular. I think given how reasonable this change seems to be, this is an application I can support just given the benefits to the art in the swing. Thank you, Kimberly. Jane and David, the floor is yours. David. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think uh, technologically it's an excellent solution. Um, proportion is really important and texture is really important. And I think that um, what uh, Kevin Roach did and 30 years ago, whatever it was, uh, I'll, mix, I'll miss the texture and the proportioning of that wall, but what we gain on the other hand is uh, a much better wall in terms of its energy efficiency, its performance, and from the inside out, it's going to be better because you will not have as many mullions, the view will be more expansive. So on balance, uh, I think it's a winner, uh, but I won't call it a home run but I do think it's the right solution. And it may be that Kevin Roach might have come up with the same solution 30 or 40 years later. So um, my compliments to Byron Linda Bell, uh, I certainly will support it. Thank you, David. Um, you know, we see so many presentations at the Landmarks Committee. It's just a joy to see a presentation that it was as thoroughly refined as this including um, showing the aerials of the overall museum, the symmetry in the east and west with the glass. It's so impressive and it speaks to how important this museum is in our wonderful city. I think we're ready to go to a vote. Um, it sounds to me like a move to approve. Anybody wanna make a resolution? Move to approve. Second. Thank you. I. Um, Will, you could ask if there's anyone opposed and they could raise their hand. Um, yeah, if, if anyone is opposed, just raise your hand so you see it. Elizabeth seems to have her hand up, or she did. Oh, I think she was just giving a thumbs up for the uh, seconding earlier. But I can yeah. check with Elizabeth really quickly. Jane, I, I just... I I just, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this or not, but I just want to disclose, I'm probably not alone in this, that I'm a member of the Met. Well, so am I, Alita. I don't think it matters in this case. <laughs> I love. I didn't either, but just to be above board on everything. So thank you. And thank I saw you Kim shaking her head too, Kimberly. Um, I think we can go to a vote. Thank you, Alita. Um, we could have a show of hands. I bet a lot of us are members there. Um, <laughs> it's great, isn't it? It's such a wonderful institution. In any case, um, is there anybody got their hand up, um, Will? No. So uh, if you're ready, I'll call the roll and unmute everybody. And we'll get okay, the go ahead. vote underway. So <laughs> sorry, I just want to make sure everybody see the vote sheet on my screen. Great. I'm just going to unmute everybody on the committee very quickly. You don't have to confirm it right away. Um, then we'll run the roll. So Elizabeth Ashby. Yes. 
All right. Uh oh. I broke my computer. Give me one second. Sorry, guys. Uh, okay. Gail Barron. Yes. Thank you. Michelle? Yes. Thank you. Alita? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Thank you. Anthony? Yes. David? Yes. Thank you. May? Yes. Thank you. Jane? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Harrison? Yes. Thank you. Marco? Yes. Christina? Yes. Thank you. And Ken? Yes. Wonderful. Unanimous approval. Well, it's really a joy to see an in, such an incredible presentation with so much historic material. Um, I'm sure somebody has an item of new business. Does anybody have an item of new business? Any hands raised, Will? No. How about old business? No old business? Well, I know that um, Elizabeth did um, draft a wonderful letter um, uh, response to the Landmarks Commission over the Civitas initial letter. Elizabeth, do you want to talk about that just for a minute? Uh, well, I just, uh, I think I emailed you uh, about it before just to see if we wanted to send a copy to uh, the author of the uh, letter that insulted us. <laughs> uh, 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 and we, were, we CC'd everybody and his brother, including the organization. They, as far as I know, they CC'd nobody, uh, and they did not CC us. Uh, uh, I was just sent a copy, emailed a copy by somebody. So that was how we knew that that uh, they had sent a letter to Landmarks uh, opposing everything we said about protecting uh, window master plans. So we wrote a letter and sent it to Landmarks and did not CC. And I just wondered whether we wanted to... Uh, send an official or unofficial copy of our letter to uh, the organization, and if so, who should send it and who should receive it. So if anybody had any thoughts, that was that I just, uh, I'm not advocating one way or the other, uh, but I think it was the kind of messy way we got the letter, and um, so I don't know what you you all think we should send them a copy or not? I sent the the copy of our letter plus the two original letters to every member of the committee. Well, I personally feel, Elizabeth, that we should send a copy of the letter that went to the commission to the head. I don't know who the um, president of the organization of Civitas is, but I definitely feel they should see our comments. I don't know if anybody has any other thoughts on that, but. I would agree with you, Jane. Yeah. First, you went of, all, to the first of all, I don't, think the they, I don't think, I don't think they gave us credit for understanding what, uh, what we were doing with respect to the master planning of these windows. And uh, I think that they should see what we were, what we were doing. I don't think we have to be antagonistic, but I think it's good if they understand mm -hmm. that they were off base. They didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> I'm saying it more nicely than you did. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with complaining about a non-existent historic district, but still. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, I, think maybe, I mean, we were fairly derogatory in our letter and, you know, maybe we should downgrade our response by just simply sending it to the organization. Well, I would send Rather it to than whoever looking. is, it should be, the letter should be addressed to someone, not just, you can't just put Civitas on the envelope. I would certainly try to find out, I'm sure it's on their website, who the head of the organization is, and they should get the letter. 
It, it might be Jim Tripp. Okay. Uh, Mark yeah. Alexander is listed as their president right now. Okay. Any other, anything else Jane, to discuss? I, I have something, if I may. I'm not really sure what to do about it, but there's a proposal to develop Governor's Island, the portion below the historic district with buildings mm. that may be as tall as 30 to 40 stories. Even though it's in CB1 and they're actually in ULERP and the ULERP meeting at CB1 is this evening, it's a citywide issue because it's a park for the entire city. It just happens to fall within CB1. And um, the buildings are just on the side. It seems I went to one of the, uh, the trusts um, presentations and it seems that the buildings are just south of the historic district. And in one of their renderings of what the historic district will look like in the winter with people building snowballs are the buildings in the background. So even though they won't be tearing anything down um, and won't be interfering in the historic area, it seems just the impact of the buildings alone will, um, will do something to that. So I just wanted to raise it. I don't really know what to do about it, but it's a citywide issue. Well, thank you, Alita. I think we'd have to see some plans. I can't, um, I mean, what do you think, David? It's, um, we have to see a visual of- I know, I have, um, they've done presentations and uh, the materials are available and I should be getting the resolution from CB1. I've asked for if they have one this evening, but um, I certainly should be able to present something. I mean, not me per. I mean, there certainly should be some some kind of visual available. Lita, I'm not familiar with the zoning on Roosevelt Island. Are you saying that they're building in a not park? Roosevelt Island? It's I mean, Governor's on, Island. Uh, I meant Ellis Island. You're, you're, Governor's you're, Island. Governor's Island. Oh, Governor's it's, Island. Um, it was deeded with housing restrictions, for instance, that there's to be no permanent housing, but they. No, I'm familiar with Governor's there. Island. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to, We don't want any tall buildings on Governor's Island. And they're intending to exactly. build dorms as fact, well. We don't want any more buildings on Governor's Island, if the truth be known. Well, mm -hmm. uh, me too, but let's see how we can approach okay. this. I mean, uh, it, uh, can we see some visuals at next month's Landmarks Committee meeting? And I'm sure. Yes. Okay, so why don't we make it on the agenda under new business for next month and make sure we get some visuals, Alita. Okay. Thank Is that okay with everyone? I don't think we yes. can take a position unless we no, see something. I agree. No, yeah, I just wasn't right. mm -hmm. sure. Thank you, David, and thank you, Jane. I wasn't sure what to do about it. So this gives this gives a direction. Thank you. Well, if if CB1 would like our support, we're maybe we're happy to, to do it once we to support once we their have... resolution, would this would be the way I'd like to go, but we yeah. need to see some visuals first. Okay. Yeah. Okay, anything else? I see Michael Whetstone is still with us. Um, a really impressive presentation. You know, the Met and that huge, seeing those aerials, what a stroke of genius that was really in the symmetry and the limestone versus the glass. Um, anybody else have any other comment on anything before we adjourn and wish everybody, well, we'll see each other on Wednesday night at our full board meeting. Um, no need for the Met to be there, um, really, at our Zoom meeting because it was a unanimous resolution from the committee. But of course, you're welcome to come and speak during the public session if you wish to. And um, thank you, Brett, as well. You spoke first. Thank you. I just want to say, I just want to briefly introduce myself. I'm Frances Escano, and I work with the Gover Government Affairs um, Department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I just want to say thank you for allowing us to present tonight. Oh, well, thank you. You have all these other boards to present to, so you'll be getting a lot more FaceTime. But nice to meet you. And if you guys haven't heard, Francis's boss, Tom Schuler, who you guys have probably seen over and over and over, over however many years, uh, he's retiring at the end of the year. Oh, my. So. Well, that's we are sad bad. for his loss, but, you know, the Met will be here and I will be here to continue on um, with everything he's done and continue our great relationship with Community Board 8. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, Guys, this is Will, so are wonderful. Will, muted? Will? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, I didn't realize, I have, my hand has been up all this I'm... while. Um, I was just going to ask Alita, has, has the Governor's yeah. Island proposal come to the Canada. borough board? Um, actually, they, it, it hasn't yet. It's in 
the first step of ULERP, but CB1 requested that Gail send a notice to all of the Manhattan boards asking if we would support C, uh, CB1's, I guess, position, but they didn't have a position. They haven't had a resolution yet. I asked the zoning committee, but they need a resolution from CB1, which may be coming tonight. Um, to be frank, this is a personal interest of mine. I've been to Governor's Island any number of times, and um, I'm trying to, not as chair of this board, which ends pretty soon anyway, but just on a personal level, to try and generate enough interest in the city to get the attention of the trust and the elected officials. Well, well thank you so much. I think if we see plans, as long as Gail is asking all the boards for commentary, that sort of does pull everybody in anyway. So if we see plans, I guess then we can address it. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. So is there a move to adjourn? Move to adjourn. No, thank you. Thanks, everyone. A great meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank, we'll thank you very much. you guys on Wednesday. Absolutely. Okay. Good night,